I'm applying for a new villain loan. Go by the name of Vector. It's a mathematical term, a quantity represented by an arrow with both direction and magnitude. Okay, today we start with uh, chapter 3, which is about vectors. It is really a purely mathematical chapter, which will enable us to make the transition from one to three-dimensional motion. In one-dimensional motion, we discussed in chapter 2, things were easy. You uh, determine the direction by putting plus or minus, but if you go to motion in three dimensions, plus and minus is not enough. You have to talk about angles. You have to talk about, or you have to talk the language of vectors. That's why we take uh, a diversion here, uh, chapter three, which is purely mathematical, but it will enable us to deal with the more general motion uh, in three dimensions that we will discuss in the next chapter. Physical quantities can be classified as vectors or scalars. These are the two types of physical quantities that we have. A vector is a physical quantity that has both magnitude and direction. To define a vector completely, you have to give its magnitude and its direction. We have seen some examples of vector quantities like displacement, velocity, and acceleration. And we will see more examples as we go in the course, like force, momentum, and torque. These are also uh, vector quantities. A vector is usually written with an arrow over its symbol to distinguish it from uh, other quantities. A scalar, the second type of uh, physical quantities, a scalar, is a physical quantity that has only a magnitude. It is completely specified or defined by giving its magnitude. Examples of scalar quantities include time, distance, mass, energy, and temperature. <coughs> we deal with the scalars by the rules of ordinary algebra. That means we treat them like numbers. We add, subtract, add them, uh, multiply them, just like we do with ordinary numbers. Scalars can have positive or negative values, not because they have directions, but depending on the reference chosen. So let's say that you go inside the refrigerator and the thermometer that you hold in your hand is calibrated in degrees C. The temperature that you will measure is minus 10 degrees C. If you go inside the same refrigerator with a thermometer that is calibrated in degrees Fahrenheit, for the same refrigerator, you will measure 18 degrees F. So the plus here or the minus there is not because temperature is a, uh, is a vector quantity, but rather because of the scale that you use. Is it the degree C or the degrees F? Let's consider as an example of a vector quantity, let's consider displacement. So we consider the motion of a particle that is shown here. The red curve is the actual motion of the particle. The blue lines are some displacement vectors. And let's remember what we said about displacement. It's a vector that connects the initial and the final point. It's a straight line that doesn't really care about what happens in the middle. It only connects the initial and the final point. Displacement vectors, like the blue arrows here, represent only the overall effect of the motion, not the motion itself. The displacement vector tells us nothing about the actual path that the particle takes. The second figure here shows the displacement vector of another particle as it changes its position from point A to point B. And as it goes from A to B, it can follow different paths, the blue one or the pink one. But in both cases, 
the displacement is the same. It's the line that connects the initial and the final points. Note that the arrows from A to B, A prime to B prime, A double prime to B double prime have the same magnitude. The lengths of these arrows are the same. <coughs> <clears throat> and they also point in the same direction. So, the conclusion we want to make out of this discussion is this one. A vector can be shifted without changing its value if its magnitude and direction are not changed. The vector here is this one. You can take it wherever you like in a space as long as you don't change its direction and as long as you don't change its magnitude. As long as you keep the magnitude and the direction of the vector, you can shift it anywhere you like, and that will simplify the way we deal with vectors mathematically. With this now, let's deal with the mathematics of vectors. We do not talk about the mathematics of scalars, because we said that scalars can be treated like numbers, add, subtract, multiply them like numbers. But vectors have to be treated especially, because they have a special characteristics. Vectors are not ordinary quantities because they have magnitude and direction. So the question we want to answer is, how do the mathematical operations, especially addition and multiplication, how do these operations apply to vectors? We will first consider adding vectors, and then we will consider the multiplication of vectors. Let's start with the addition of vectors. Again, the rules for the ordinary algebra do not apply to vectors because they have both magnitude and direction. So the question now is how do we add vectors? Well, there are two ways to add vectors. A graphical way and a mathematical way. So the first method is called the geometrical or the graphical method. Graphical means you draw the vectors on a piece of paper and then add them graphically. The second method is called the analytical method, where you resolve the vector into its components, add them mathematically without necessarily uh, drawing the vector. Whichever technique you use, the graphical or the analytical, the vector sum of two or more vectors is called the resultant of the vectors. So let's talk about the geometrical or graphical method of adding vectors. Here again, under the geometrical method, there are two ways to add vectors, both of them graphical methods. The first one is called the head-tail method, and the second one is called the parallelogram method. These are the two graphical or geometrical techniques to add vectors. So let's start with the head-tail method. Let's say that you want to add two vectors A and B. How do we add them graphically using the head tail method. Here are the two vectors that we want to add. Well, you start with the first vector, vector A. You draw it. You can shift it anywhere you like as long as you don't change its direction and magnitude. And then at the tip or head of A, you draw a coordinate system like this one. And then you draw the second vector, vector B, with its tail at the head of A. That's why we call it the head-tail method, the head-tail method. You draw the vector B there. Again, you can shift it anywhere you like, as long as you don't rotate it or don't change its magnitude. So at the head of A, we draw the vector B with its tail at the head of A. Where is the resultant? The resultant is the vector that goes from the tail of the first vector to the head of the second vector. So there we have the resultant of the two vectors found graphically. You can, of course, apply the head tail method, not necessarily for two. You can apply it to as many vectors as you have. Here is an example. You draw vector A, and then from its head, you draw, uh, sorry, vector one, from its head, you draw the second vector, 2. And then from the head of 2, you draw the third vector. Here it is 3. 
and then from the head of three you draw the fourth vector which is this one where is the resultant the resultant is the vector that closes the diagram so it goes from the uh, tail of the first one to the head of the last one there is the resultant and here you can see it so what are the magnitude and direction of the resultant well the magnitude you just measure the length of this line multiplied by the scale of your drawing and the direction is the angle that the resultant makes with the horizontal positive x axis this is the first technique the head tail method the second graphical technique is called the parallelogram method let's see how it works in this method the tails of the two vectors a and b are drawn at the same point okay so here are the two vectors we draw them so that their tails touch at the same point contrary to the first one in the first one what did we do we draw vector b here at the head of a now we draw the two vectors with their tails at the same point how do we find the resultant well you find the resultant by completing the parallelogram here is the parallelogram okay so you draw a line parallel to a a line parallel to b that is the parallelogram and the resultant is the line or the vector that goes from the origin to the opposite corner of the uh, parallelogram it is the diagonal of the parallelogram now the parallelogram uh, technique is very useful because we can calculate the magnitude of the resultant in this case the magnitude of the resultant is equal to magnitude of a squared plus magnitude of b squared plus <coughs> 2ab cosine of the angle theta between the two vectors and you can immediately make some special cases out of this like we see in here if theta is zero if theta is zero the two vectors are parallel to each other pointing in the same direction what do we have you put zero there and there you have a complete square take its square root and you have a plus b if on the other hand the angle theta is 180 degrees they are completely opposite to each other cosine of 180 is minus 1 so this will be minus 2ab take it out of the square root and that will be a minus b so the maximum magnitude of the resultant is when the two vectors are parallel to each other the lowest value of the magnitude of the resultant is when they are opposite to each other if the two vectors are perpendicular to each other 90 degrees then that is equal to a squared plus b squared under the square root again how do we find the magnitude and direction of the resultant with the magnitude you uh, uh, measure with a ruler the length of this uh, line in here and multiply it by the scale of the drawing and the uh, direction is the angle that the resultant makes with the positive x direction and again you can apply the parallelogram method to as many vectors as you like you take them in pairs two at a time find the resultant and then add the next one the third one and so on so these uh, are the graphical techniques and how do we use them to find the vector sum or the resultant of two vectors now we want to uh, move into the analytical mathematical technique but before we go there we have to uh, lay down the background mathematically to see how do we calculate uh, the resultant of two vectors analytically to do that we have to do some background work and the first thing we want to consider here are the rules the rules of vector addition and there are two rules that we want to uh, deal with the first one is called the associative law okay the first one is called the associative law and, uh, sorry it's the commutative law 
and this is a very simple one. So let's say that we consider two vectors, consider two vectors, let's call them A and B, and their resultant, let's call it S, so that S is equal to A plus B. Remember, this is vector addition, not the ordinary addition. The first rule is called the commutative law. And it is a very simple law about the order of the addition. And it says A plus B is equal to B plus A. So the order really doesn't matter which one you start with. And you can see that in here. Here are the two vectors. Whether you start with A and then add B, or whether you start with B and then add A, the result that is the same. So that is the uh, commutative law. The second law is called the associative law. Okay? Associative law. And this is when we have more than two vectors. It says A plus B plus C is equal to A plus B plus C. It means that it doesn't matter which two vectors you add first to the third one. And that's shown at the bottom in here. Okay, here are three vectors, A, B, and C. So if we take them together all at once, A plus B plus C, that will be the resultant. The dark line in here is the resultant, A plus B plus C. Now you can break down this uh, process. You can, for example, first add B and C to give you the resultant, B plus C, and then add A. So A plus the resultant of B plus C will give us the total overall resultant, a plus B plus C, which is the same as that one. Or you can first add A and B. A plus B will give you the green line, and then add C to that. The resultant is A plus B plus C, which is the same as that one there. The next quantity that we want to define here is the negative, the negative of a vector. What is the negative of a vector? The negative of a vector is another vector, as we can see in here. Here is vector b, and here is minus b. It's a vector that has the same magnitude as the original one, but points in the opposite direction. And that will enable us to deal with the subtraction of vectors. For example, if I have a minus b, a minus b, this is, for example, the subtraction of two vectors, you can deal with it as addition of vectors by saying that this is a plus minus b. So you add vector a to the negative of vector b, and that's how the subtraction of vector uh, goes. The next thing, so th these are the simple rules of vector additions. The next thing we want to consider is the components of vectors. Components of vectors. What is the component of a vector? What is the component of a vector? What the component of a vector is its projection, al isqat its projection on the coordinate axis. So here, for example, we have vector A. We can find its components by projecting, okay, projecting the vectors onto the coordinate axis. How do we do that? Well, you draw lines from the ends of the vector 
that are perpendicular to that axis. So the x component of vector A, which we write as AX, is obtained by drawing lines from the ends of vector A that are perpendicular to the x-axis. The y component of vector A, which is AY, is obtained by the same way, drawing lines from the ends of vector A that are perpendicular to uh, the y-axis. So these are the components of vector A. And this process of projecting the vectors onto the two axes is called the resolution. We resolve the vector into its components. Now, these are very convenient, especially when we deal with the mathematical operations related to vectors. Okay, so we want to uh, analyze this picture here in detail. Let's move these two components to close this triangle in here. So move AX here and move AY there to get this triangle in here. By this triangle, we can relate the vector to its components. Let's see how. If, for example, I know the vector A and I know the angle it makes with the positive x-axis, then I can find its components as you can see from this figure in here. For example, the x component of the vector is equal to a cosine of theta. Okay? You can see from here. What is cosine of theta? Cosine of theta is equal to ax divided by a. ax divided by a. So ax is a cosine of theta. Likewise, the y component of the vector Look at the sine of the angle. Sine of theta is equal to AY, the opposite side, AY divided by A. So AY is equal to A sine of theta. What is A? A is the magnitude of vector A, which we can write simply as A without an arrow, or sometimes you find it written this way, like an absolute value. This means the magnitude of A. What about the angle theta? We have to specify it very clearly. Theta is the angle between vector A and the positive x-axis, okay? The positive x-axis measured, measured counterclockwise. Okay, counterclockwise. So, for example, if I have a vector A here, where is the angle theta? We start with the positive x-axis, go counterclockwise until we reach A. So, here is the angle theta. It is not this angle here. It is the angle measured from the positive x-axis counterclockwise. Now, let's say that we have the other way around. If I have the vector and its angle, this is how I calculate the components. Suppose I want to do the opposite, that is, I know the components, how do I reconstruct the uh, vector itself? Well, again, look at this triangle in here. The magnitude of vector A is equal to, just apply Pythagoras, it's this square plus that square. It's a x squared plus a y squared under the square root. The angle it makes with the uh, x axis theta, you can see from this figure that tangent of theta is a y over a x. So the angle theta is tangent inverse of a y divided by a x. But be careful, this is only true if the vector A is in the first quadrant. If it is in any other quadrant, you have to be careful how to deal with the angle, and we will see how to treat it in the uh, examples and problems. So this is how we calculate the components of a vector. The next quantity, or the next concept that we want to uh, deal with, is called the unit vectors, okay? unit vectors. What is 
a unit vector. Unit here means one. So a unit vector is a vector whose magnitude is equal to one and points in a certain direction. Its purpose, the purpose of the unit vector is to specify a direction. So if you have, let's say, a vector A pointing in a certain direction and you want to define that direction, you come up or you calculate what we call a unit vector whose vector is, uh, whose magnitude is equal to one and whose direction is in the same direction as the vector A. So the way we define the unit vector along a certain vector A, and we call it like this, A hat. This hat, means that we are dealing with a unit vector. It's equal to, for any vector, it's equal to the vector itself divided by the magnitude of the vector. And again, its purpose is to show to show a certain direction. This is the purpose of a unit vector, to show or determine or specify a direction. Along the coordinate axis, we have three unit vectors. The unit vector along the x-axis is called I. The one along the y-axis is called j, and the one along the z-axis is called k. So what is i? i is a vector whose magnitude is equal to 1 and points along the positive x direction. j is a vector whose magnitude is equal to 1 points along the positive y direction, and k is a vector whose magnitude is equal to 1 points along the positive x direction. And these are extremely useful in writing the vectors compactly mathematically. For example, if I have a vector and it is written as, let's say, a vector uh, C is equal to 3i minus 4j. What does it mean? I can get all the information I need from these numbers. This is a vector whose x component is positive, y component is negative. Where is that? Positive x, negative y. This is a vector somewhere here in the fourth quadrant. Its x component is 3, its y component is 4. So what is the magnitude of the vector? Here it is. Okay. It is 3 squared plus 4 squared under the root. So the magnitude of vector c is equal to 5. What angle does it make? Well, you have to draw uh, the, the, the vector, uh, first find its angle in the fourth quadrant, and then find the angle it makes from the positive x direction. And we got all that information by writing the vector compactly in the unit vector notation. The last thing we have today, just let me bring it to your attention. Uh, there is a very good summary in the textbook, page 39 about angles, radians, degrees, trigonometric functions, sine, cosine, and tangent. So if you remember these, that's okay. If you want to refresh your memory about these quantities, then there is a very concise, very nice summary review about these quantities on that page, so you can read about it. Another thing you can read from the book is uh, sample problem 301. Uh, it's about the Victor addition, so I leave that for you to read from the textbook. Let's now look at some other examples, problems, and checkpoints from the textbook on uh, the vector addition that we discussed today. Let's start with this checkpoint. It's about the graphical techniques that we discussed at the beginning. A checkpoint two says, in the figure, we have six parts. In the figure, which of the indicated methods of combining the X and Y components of vector A? So what do we have here? We have the components of a vector, AX and AY. We want to combine them to give us the vector A. So which of these are correct combinations, which are incorrect combinations? So. In the figure, which of the indicated methods of combining the x and y components of a vector 
are proper to determine the vector. Remember that we have the head tail method and the parallelogram method. If the tails of the two vectors touch, that's the parallelogram. If it is head and then tail, then that is the head tail method. So let's start with the first one here. Here the tails touch. So this is basically the parallelogram method. The question is, is this the correct figure? Well, in the parallelogram method, remember where is the resultant? The resultant goes this way. It goes from the origin to the opposite side of the parallelogram, which is exactly the opposite of what we have here. And therefore, this is an incorrect combination. This one here is again parallelogram, tail with tail. But again, the resultant should be that way, which is not what is shown in the figure. So again, this is an incorrect combination. <coughs> the third one, what do we have here? This is a head tail method, vector one and then vector two. Where is the resultant? The resultant goes from the tail of the first to the head of the last. So yes, this is the correct combination of the two components in the head tail method, and that's the correct one. The next one here, what did we do? Instead of starting with X, we start with the Y component. So AY and then AX. The resultant will be from the tail of the first to the head of the last one. That is the resultant, and yes, this is a correct combination. Now, this one here, this is again head tail, <coughs> like this one, X then Y, but look at the direction of the, re the resultant. That's the wrong direction. It goes that way from the tail of the first to the head of the last. So this is an incorrect combination. Finally here, the two tails touch of AX and AY. So this is the parallelogram. The resultant will go from the origin to the opposite side or the opposite corner of the parallelogram as it is shown in here. So this is the correct parallelogram combination of the two components. Next, let us look at problem two in the textbook. This is about the components of a vector. Now, you can have two ways, two types of problems. You can be given the vector and asked to resolve it into its components, or vice versa. You can be given the components and asked to reconstruct the figure or the uh, vector. Which one is this one? Well, this is the first one. We are given a vector, and we are asked to find its components. Let's read the problem. The problem says a displacement vector r in the xy plane is 12 meters long, so that's the magnitude of the vector, and is directed at an angle of 30 degrees, as shown in the figure. So we are given the magnitude and the angle the magnitude and the angle, okay? What do we want to find here? We want to find the x component of the vector and the y component of the vector and finally write it in unit vector notation. So let us do that. The vector is already, uh, is already made in the order we want it to be, okay? We are given the magnitude and the angle it makes with the x-axis. So let's find the components. The components are calculated using these equations here. So let us use these equations. And the x component of vector r, this is problem two from the book. The x component is equal to r cosine of theta. R is the magnitude, 12. 12 times cosine of 30 degrees, and that would be, uh, that would be equal to 10.4 meters. The Y component is R sine of theta. That is 12 times sine of 30 degrees, which will be equal to 6.0 meters. So here are the components of the vector. 
we can write it in unit vector notation like this r is equal to rx i plus r y j what is rx there it is so this is 10.4 i plus 6.0 j in meters that's the unit of measurement and there we have our answer the second problem is the other way around we are given the uh, components of the vector and we are requested to find the vector itself this is problem three from the old edition of the textbook what does it say it says the x component of vector a is minus 25 and the y component is plus 40 so here are the x and y components what is the magnitude of a what the magnitude is there you square the components, add them, and take the square root. So what will that be? The magnitude of A is equal to AX squared plus AY squared under the square root. In our case, this will be 25 squared plus 40 squared under the square root of course minus or plus that will be cancelled by the square in here so this will be equal to 47.2 meters that's the magnitude of a now what is the angle between a and the positive direction of the x-axis here you have to be careful and a, a very convenient thing to do is to sketch the vector ask yourself where is this vector in which quadrant is this vector well this vector has negative x component positive y component negative x positive y so this is a vector that is in the second quadrant that's vector a what we want is to find the angle theta remember how did we define the angle theta it goes from the positive x-axis measured counterclockwise now with the plus and minus that we have here if you put that in your calculator you may run into trouble so the best way is to do it carefully as we have in here the way i will do it is always find the smallest angle made between the vector and the x-axis in that quadrant so here is the vector a in the second quadrant what is the angle it makes with the x-axis. Well, it makes this angle here, okay? That is angle phi. Let's find how much is phi. That's not difficult to find because the length of this side is the y component, which is 40, and the length of this side is the absolute value of the x component which is 25. Now, how much is the angle phi? Well, the angle phi is equal to tangent inverse of 40 over 25. Note that I didn't put any negative signs. That's why I do it this way. So I get relief from the negative signs. And if you use your calculator, you will find that this is equal to 58 degrees. Now, what is the angle theta that I'm looking for? You can see that theta is 180 degrees minus 5. So 180 minus 58, and that will give me a value of 122 degrees. That's the angle theta. If the vector is in the third quadrant, I repeat the same thing, but then add 180. If it is in the fourth quadrant, then I will do the same thing, but in that case, subtract it from 360, and that's how I find the angle uh, that the vector makes with the positive x-axis measured counterclockwise. Finally, we will conclude with uh, a conceptual exam problem about the concept of unit vectors. This is an exam problem. It's a mixture of conceptual and numerical problem. The problem says, 
Which of the following? You are given four choices. Which of the following is not a unit vector? Is not a unit vector. Remember, how did we define a unit vector? It's a vector whose magnitude is equal to one. So, which of these does not have a magnitude of one? Well, let's start with the first one. I plus J over two. Split it. It's one half I plus one half J. I just split it. What is written in here? Find the magnitude of this. Here it is. One fourth plus one fourth under the square root. So this would be square root of one half. Is that equal to one? No. So this is not a unit vector. What about this one? Well, this is how we define a unit vector. If you take a vector, divide it by its magnitude, you will get a unit vector. So this is a unit vector. What about this one? Find its magnitude. This is square, okay? This is square is 0.36, plus this is square, 0.64, add them, you get one. So this is a unit vector. What about this? It's one third i, one over root three i, plus one over root three j, plus one over th root three k. Square, and then add. One over three, plus one over three, I'm squaring these. One over three, plus one over three, plus one over three is one. So again, this is a unit vector. So our conclusion is, all of these are unit vectors because their magnitude is equal to one, but this one is not a unit vector because its magnitude is not equal to one. The last thing we have here is another conceptual uh, problem which is about the parallelogram method, okay? Let me remind you, what did we say in the parallelogram method? In the parallelogram method, we have seen that the magnitude of the resultant of the two vectors, if we have two vectors, A and B, and their resultant is R, then the magnitude of R is A squared plus B squared plus 2ab cosine of theta under the square root. And we have seen that the limits of the magnitude of r is that if theta is equal to zero, when the two vectors are in the same direction, r is equal to a plus b. The other extreme is when theta is 180 degrees, that is the two vectors are exactly opposite to each other, in that case, r is equal to a minus b. So these are the limits of the resultant. It cannot be more than the sum. It cannot be less than the difference of the two vectors. So with that, let's look at this problem. It says vector a of magnitude 20 and vector b is added to vector b of magnitude 25. The magnitude of the resultant a plus b can be which of these? Well, according to what we have here, it cannot be more than the sum. It cannot be more than 45. Okay? It cannot be more than 45. But also, it cannot be less than the difference. It cannot be less than 5. Okay? So, the resultant of these two vectors will be in this range. So, look at the numbers. Can it be 3? No, 3 is less than 5. Cannot be 3. It cannot be 0. Can it be 12? Well, 12 is in this range. So yes, this is a possible uh, answer. Can it be 47 or 50? No, these are more than 45. And therefore, the only possible answer out of these is answer C, where the, um, the resultant has a magnitude of 12 you can, of course, go back and find which angle theta will give you that magnitude of the resultant. And these are the uh, topics we have in our first lecture on Chapter 3. Okay, today we have our second lecture on chapter 3, which is about uh, vectors. 
And let's start with a review of the material that we covered in the last lecture. We have introduced vectors and scalars. We reviewed the addition of vectors and we have seen that we have two techniques, the geometrical or graphical techniques and the analytical mathematical technique. Under the geometrical addition, we consider two techniques, the head tail method and the parallelogram method. We also reviewed two important rules of vector addition, the commutative law, which says that the order of addition is immaterial, and the associative law, which enables us to uh, deal with the case where we have more than two vectors to be added. Then we consider the components of vector, the resolution of the vector into its x, y, and if necessary, z components, and finally, unit vectors. With these ideas, we are now in a position that enables us to deal with the analytical, mathematical way of adding vectors. So, let's see how it works, the analytical techniques. Analytical method. Let's say that we have two vectors, A and B, and we want to add them to give us vector R. Okay, so we have vectors A and B. We want to add them vectorially to give us the resultant R. How do we do that analytically? Well, the first step is to write vectors A and B in unit vector notation. That's the simplest, straightforward uh, way to go. So you write A as AXI plus AYJ plus AZK. And you write the vector B in the same way, BXI plus BYJ plus BZK. So here we resolve the vectors into their components. Then you start forming the components of vector R itself. First, the X component of R. What you have to do, just add the X components of the vectors. So it will be AX plus BX. The Y component of R is AY plus BY. And the Z component of R is AZ plus BZ. With this now, you can find the magnitude of R itself. R is equal to Rx squared plus Ry squared plus Rz squared under the square root. The angle, you have to be careful about it because now you talk about three dimensions. So you have, so you have to uh, deal with it case by case. But you can write the vector R in unit vector notation as R is equal to Rxi, that's what you found here, plus Ryj plus Rzk. And in this way, we have completely defined the resultant of the two vectors, and that's how the analytical method works. It, is, it looks very simple now, because we have done all the background work of resolving the vectors, the unit vectors, and so on. The last thing we want to consider before we move from the addition of vectors is the rotation of vectors. Sometimes we need to rotate a vector, so let's deal with that. <coughs> okay? So let's talk about the rotation of vectors. So far, we have selected the coordinate axis to be parallel to the edges of the page. This is the typical way to go. This is the x-axis parallel to this side, and this is the y-axis parallel to this side. So these are, this is the typical choice of axes. We could also rotate the axes, okay? We could rotate the axes, not the vector itself, not that the vector A here as the same as the vector A here. We didn't touch the vector. What, what we did is to rotate the axes themselves. So x is rotated, becomes x prime. y is rotated, it becomes y prime. And we 
do the rotation by some angle phi. Theta is the angle of the vector itself, phi is the angle of rotation. Note that the magnitude of the vector does not change, okay? The magnitude of the vector A here, okay, how much is that? That much is the same as the magnitude of the vector A here. We didn't touch the magnitude of the vector. Where is the change? The change is in the components. The X component, the new X component, is larger than the old X component. And the new Y component is shorter than the old Y component. But the magnitude of the vector doesn't change. In the old system, it is AX squared plus AY squared under the root. In the new system, it is AX prime squared plus AY prime squared. The magnitudes are equal, but the components will be different depending on the rotation. It is just how do you stress the angle or the view of the vector. For example, let's say that I want to take a picture of this one. Okay? If, let's say that we sit it this way. If I bring my camera this way, then I will see the yellow side. Okay? I will stress the yellow or whatever this color is. If I look this way, then I will stress the black side of the object. It is the same object. I didn't rotate it. I didn't play with it. It is just how do I view the object. Depending on my view, I will stress a certain part or a certain side of the object. Now, why do we need to deal with this? Why do we need to talk about the rotation of the vectors? Here is why. The point behind this discussion is that we have great freedom in choosing a coordinate system because the relations among the vectors, the addition, the multiplication of vectors, do not depend on the location of the origin or the orientation of the axes. An example is shown here. This, this is a situation that we will come across frequently when we discuss dynamics and uh, Newton's laws where we have an object moving on an inclined plane. You can definitely take the typical choice of axes, x parallel to the ground, y perpendicular to the ground, or you can choose your axes this way. The x-axis is parallel to the incline itself, and the y-axis is perpendicular to the incline. You will see when we discuss the dynamical problems that this choice is more convenient. It will simplify the angles uh, uh, that, that are requested in this situation and it will make the mathematics easier to do than the old system. So we are free uh, to choose either one of the two because the speed doesn't change, the magnitude of the acceleration does not change uh, on the basis of the coordinate axes that you choose. So this is about the first part of the mathematics of vectors, which is the addition of vectors. Now let's come to the second part, which is the multiplication of vectors. And let's first state down the various situations that we can have with regard to multiplications. Vectors can be multiplied by scalars or vectors. You can take a vector, multiply it by a scalar, by a number, or you can multiply it by another vector. Let's deal with the first one because it's easier to see. Multiplication of a vector by a scalar, by a number, results in elongation, extension, enlargement, or reduction of the vector. As you can see in here, here is vector A. If I multiply it by a number less than one, the magnitude will shrink the vector will be reduced, the magnitude will be reduced. <coughs> if I multiply it by a number greater than one, then I am enlarging the vector. The vector is extended or elongated. What if I multiply it by a negative number? You will simply reverse the direction of the vector if you multiply it by a negative number. So this is uh, the very simple situation of multiplying a vector by a scalar, multiplying a vector by a number. Now let's come to the more difficult one, which is multiplying a vector by another vector. 
there are two ways to multiply a vector by a vector. One way produces a scalar. So you multiply two vectors to give you a scalar. And that's why it's called the scalar product. The other one is you multiply two vectors to bring a third vector. And therefore it's called the vector product. So we have two types of vector multiplication, the scalar product and the vector product. And we want to now define these uh, products and see how do we calculate them. Let's start with the first one, which is the scalar product of two vectors. <clears throat> so here is the first one, the scalar product of two vectors. Scalar product. Again here, you multiply the two vectors to produce a scalar. How is that defined? Well, the scalar product, the scalar product of two vectors, of vectors, of vectors A and B is defined as, this is how we define, the scalar product is defined as A dot B. This is how we write it, the scalar product. A dot B is equal to A times B times cosine of the angle phi. Where? In this equation, A is the magnitude of vector A, B is the magnitude of vector B, and phi is the angle between the two vectors, as you can see in here. And when we say the angle between the two vectors, we always mean the smaller angle, because if you have two vectors like this, how many angles are there between them? Two angles, this one and this one. When we say the angle between the two vectors, we always mean the smaller angle between the two vectors. And from the way it is written, this is also called the dot product, the scalar product or the dot product because of this dot between the two vectors. Now, why do we define things this way? Well, there is a physical necessity behind it. Let's take an example. Suppose that we have the ground here, level ground, horizontal uh, surface, and here is a box of some mass, and I want to move the box horizontally, not vertically, horizontally. And to do that, I will use some force, some pulling force F to do that. So how do I measure the ability of the force F to move the box horizontally? We define a quantity that we will study in chapter seven called the work, the work of the force, which is how much is the force able to move this box? And it is equal to F times D times cosine of the angle <coughs> between the force F, let's call it phi, and the displacement, okay? The box is displaced horizontally. So it is the angle between the force and the displacement, which is exactly like saying the work is the scalar product of F and D. You can see why we take the cosine, not the sine. If the angle phi is zero, then this is FD, this is the maximum ability of the force to move the box. If the angle phi is 90, cosine of that is zero, the box will never move horizontally, but it may move vertically. And here we are interested in moving it horizontally. So if the angle phi is zero, it will never move horizontally, and that's exactly expressed like here, and that's how the scalar product is uh, is written. Now, what is the geometrical meaning of the scalar product? How do we look at it graphically or geometrically? Well, that is shown in here. The scalar product, which is given by this equation, 
is regarded as the product of two quantities, okay? The magnitude of one vector and the scalar component of the second vector along the direction of the first one, or the projection. And that is explained in here, a dot b is equal to a b equals i and phi. You can rewrite this one here as b times a cosine of phi. And that's what we are saying here. The scalar product is simply the product of one vector, b, times the projection of the other vector along b. What is a cosine of phi? Look at here. a cosine of phi is this line in here, which is the projection of a along the direction of b. So, in other words, the scalar product shows us how much is one vector projected along the other one. If they are in the same direction, that's maximum projection. They just touch each other. If they are perpendicular to each other, there is no projection at all, okay? This vector here will not project on this one in here. The projection is zero. So that's exactly what we are saying in here. Now let us take some special cases of the scalar product. Okay, so here are some remarks regarding the scalar product. First, some special cases. If phi is equal to zero, then a dot b cosine of zero is one. A dot b is simply a times b. You just multiply the magnitude of the two uh, vectors, and that's the maximum value we can have for the scalar product of two vectors. If phi is equal to 90 degrees, they do not project like we said, they're perpendicular to each other. Cosine of 90 is zero, a dot b is equal to zero. And that means no projection. They do not project on each other. Second, what is the scalar product of a vector by itself? a dot a. Well, the angle between the vector and itself is zero. Cosine of zero is one. a times a is a squared. So the scalar product of a vector by itself is simply the square of its magnitude. Third, the order of the scalar product is immaterial. That is, a dot b is the same as b dot a. And that is shown in here. a b cosine phi is like b a cosine of phi. So the order is immaterial. What about the unit vectors? The uh, scalar product of unit vectors. Here are again the unit vectors along the x, y, and z uh, axes. What is i dot i? i dot i is equal to 1, according to this. Because it's a unit vector, it has magnitude of 1, 1 squared is 1. Likewise, j dot j is equal to 1, k dot k is equal to 1. What about the mix? Okay, if we mix them, what is i dot j? Well, i and j are perpendicular to each other. The angle between them is 90, so this is 0. i dot k is again 0. j dot k is equal to 0. That will bring us to the last point we have with regard to the special, uh, to the scalar product, and that is how do we carry out the scalar product if the vectors are given in unit vector notation? The simple way is this one. If we have the magnitudes of the two vectors and the angle between them, that's a straightforward way to go. But what if the vectors are not given like in here, but rather given in unit vector notation. How do we find them? Well, if the two vectors are given in unit vector notation, let's say a is ax i plus ay j plus az k, and the second vector b is given as bx i plus by j plus bz k, then the dot product of these two vectors 
just multiply them. In principle, you have nine terms. Three times three is nine. But six out of the nine is zero because of that. Whenever you have a mix, I, J, J, K, K, I, that will be zero. What will survive? The three similar ones, I dot I, J dot J, K dot K. So that is this one, this one, and that one, because that's I dot I, J dot J, K dot K. What do you have? A, X, B, X, and then I dot I is one, okay? Plus A, Y, B, Y, J dot J is 1, plus A, Z, B, Z, K dot K is 1. So here we complete the picture. If we are given the magnitudes and the angle, then that's how we calculate the scalar product. <coughs> if we are given the vectors in unit vector notation, then this is how we carry out the scalar product. So that is the first type of vector multiplication. We multiply two vectors, okay? We multiply two vectors to bring us a scalar. This is just a number, okay? A number times a number times a number. So you have a simple number. Now let us consider the second type of uh, vector multiplication, which is the vector product. We multiply two vectors to come up with a third vector. So that is called the vector product. The vector product. What we have here is we multiply two vectors A and B. A cross B, this is how we write it. This is the vector product. We multiply two vectors to bring a third vector C. So from the way it is written, it is called the cross product of the two vectors. So we multiply two vectors to give us a third vector. This vector now is a vector, so it has magnitude and direction. What is the magnitude of the vector C? The magnitude of the vector C is equal to A times B times sine of phi. Okay, instead of the cosine, now we take the sine. So you multiply the magnitudes of the two vectors times the sine of the angle between them. The direction of the vector C is given by the right-hand rule. Okay, how does the right-hand rule work? Well, here is how it works, okay? You start with the first vector, turn into the second vector, and your thumb will give you the result. So let's say that we have these two vectors, vectors A and vector B. And I want to find A cross B. I use the right hand, the right hand rule to do that. How do we do it? You extend the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the first vector, which is A. And then you curve it, you turn it toward the second vector, which is B. So A cross B. This is the vector C, okay, in this direction. And it is perpendicular to the plane formed by the two, uh, the two vectors. So in this case, this is the vector C, which is A cross B. What if I reverse the order? If I want B cross A? Apply the right hand rule. Extend the fingers of your right hand along the first vector, which is B, and then go to A. Now, I cannot do this because that will take the larger angle. I always have to focus on the smaller angle. So I twist my hand accordingly. This is B cross A, and that will give me a vector in that direction. So in that case, the vector C will be pointing that way, exactly in the opposite direction. And from here, you can see that the order is very important. A cross B is opposite to B cross A. Okay, the order is very important. Uh, but again, the result of the multiplication is perpendicular to the plane that is formed by the two vectors, as you can see in here. This is the plane, the blue one. is the plane formed by A and B, 
a vector c is perpendicular uh, to that plane. Now, why do we define, again, the, the, the vector product this way, sine, not cosine? One example of that that we will study later on in, in, in the rotation, uh, the rotation um, chapters, let's say that I have an object of arbitrary shape, and I fix it in here, okay? I pin it there, and I want to rotate it. The way to rotate it is to apply a force, okay? So here is the force that I will use to rotate the object. And I ask again, how do I measure the ability of the force to rotate this object? The way to do it is to draw a vector from the center of rotation to the point of application of the force, okay? That is the vector, we call it the vector R. And then look at the angle between the force F and the vector R. If the force F is here, if the angle is zero, this force will not be able to rotate the object. It can't pull it, but it can rotate it. As the angle phi increases, the ability of the force to rotate the object increases. And what will increase with increasing the angle? It is the sign. So that's how we define the ability of the force to rotate the object was something that we will call the torque of the force. Like we did with the scalar product, let's go through some special situations. Like we did there. First, the vector product of two vectors will be in the following way. If the angle phi between the two vectors is, uh, if, if the two vectors are parallel, if A is parallel to B, this means parallel. So either zero or 180 degrees. If they are parallel, sine of zero or 180 is zero. So A cross B is zero. If they are perpendicular to each other, like this, this is the symbol that we use for perpendicular. Then in that case, what do we have? A cross B, the magnitude of uh, the vector or cross product will have its maximum value, which is AB, because then sine of phi is equal to one. Second, the cross product of a vector with itself is zero, because the angle between the vector at itself is zero. Third, like we said, the order is important. A cross B is equal to minus B cross A. If you reverse the order, you introduce a negative sign. What about the unit vectors? The unit vectors are in the, in the following way, I cross I, is equal to j cross j is equal to k cross k is equal to zero because the, the cross product of a vector by itself is zero. What if I have a mixture a cross, uh, sorry, i cross j or j cross k or k cross i? In that way, we use what we call, one way to go is to use the triangle rule you make a triangle like this in this order i is here j is here k is here if you go in this order the product of two will give you the third one so i cross j will give me k j cross k will give me i k cross i will give me j if i reverse the order i introduce a negative sign so I cross K will give me minus J and so on. That's very useful when we deal with vectors written in the unit vector notation, as we will see later on in the uh, examples. So that completes uh, our discussion of chapter three. We have dealt with the addition and multiplication of vectors. What we will do in the remaining time is we will look at some examples from the textbook on the addition of vectors using the analytical method and the multiplication of vectors. And then we will 
conclude by looking at some uh, textbook problems. So let's first do the example on the addition of vectors using the analytical technique. <coughs> Here is the example from the book. The example says, this is the analytical uh, technique. The figure shows the following three vectors in, unit, in units of meters. So we have three vectors. The first step is done. They are already expressed in unit vector notation. Vector A, positive x, negative y, so positive x, negative y, fourth quadrant, that's A. B, negative x, positive y, second quadrant, and C is along the negative y direction. Okay, the problem says, what is the vector sum or resultant R, that is the vector sum of these three? Well, the vectors are already uh, resolved into unit vector notation, so we will go ahead immediately combine the components. And this is sample problem 3.04. R is equal to, let's add the X components. 4.2 here, minus 1.6 here, nothing here. So it will be 4.2 minus 1.6 R. Then we go to the Y components, minus 1.5, plus 2.9, minus 3.7. So, minus 1.5, plus 2.9, minus 3.7J. Now, just add these numbers, and what you have is 2.6I, and then these will give me minus 2.3J in units of meters. This is the resultant in unit vector notation. By now, you should know that there are two ways to represent a vector, the unit vector notation or the angle magnitude notation. So let's get the magnitude and the angle corresponding to this vector here. That's the other representation. Unit vector notation, magnitude, angle notation. What's the magnitude of this vector? R is equal to 2.6 squared plus 2.3 squared under the square root, and that will be uh, equal to 3.5 meters. This is the magnitude, the length of the vector. What angle does it make? Well, draw the vector, sketch the vector, see where is the vector, and then proceed from there. If we uh, draw the vector here, sketch it. Where is this vector? It has positive x component, negative y component. So it is somewhere here in the fourth quadrant. And we are interested in this angle, the angle it makes counterclockwise with the positive x axis. And the way to do it is to first find the angle that the vector makes with the x axis in that quadrant, which is this angle here, we will call it phi. What do we have here? This is the y component of vector r, which is 2.3, just a value. And this one here is the x component, which is 2.6. So phi is equal to tangent inverse of 2.3, divided by 2.6. And that will give me a value of 42, uh, to be exact, 41.5 degrees. So the angle theta is 360 minus five. 360 minus this will be 318.5 degrees. And here we have the complete description of the resultant either in unit vector notation or in 
magnitude and pigmentation. And this is how the analytical method works. Now let's look at some problems involving the multiplication of vectors. And we will first look at this sample problem from uh, the textbook. It's about a very important concept, and that is using the scalar product to find the angle between two vectors. If the two vectors are in the xy plane, you can sketch them and find the angle. But what if they are in three dimensions? One vector is here, and the other one is there. They are scattered in three dimensions. How do you find the angle? You cannot do a sketch here. So here is a very simple, uh, very nice, very useful way to find the angle between two vectors, no matter where they are. The problem says, what's the angle phi between the following two vectors? Vector A is 3i minus 4j, so it is in the fourth quadrant in the xy plane. But vector B, note, it has a k, a z component, so it is somewhere here. One vector is in this plane, the other one is there. How do you find the angle? It's very difficult to draw, but we will do it using the scalar product. So, we will first find the magnitudes of the two vectors. What is the magnitude of A? It is 3 squared, 9, plus 4 squared, 16, under the square root, that is 5. The magnitude of B is 4 plus 9, which is 3 squared, under the square root, square root of 13 is 3.6. Next, let us find the scalar product of these two vectors. They are written in unit vector notation. Remember what we said? You multiply the i with i, the j with j, the k with k. So, do we have i's? Yes, we have i here and i here. 3 times minus 2 is minus 6. Next, let us look at the k's, uh, the j's. We have j here, but no j's in here, so 0. What about the k's? We have a k here, but no k in here, so 0. That's the only thing we have. Now bring in the definition of the scalar product. a dot b is equal to a b cosine of phi. So cosine of phi is equal to a dot b divided by a b, or phi is equal to cosine inverse of a dot b divided by a b, which is cosine inverse of a dot b minus 6 divided by a times b, which is 5 times 3.6. Put these numbers in your calculator and you will get the answer as 108 degrees. What's the other angle? What's, what other angle can give me the same cosine? Well, the other one is 251. 251 degrees. Find cosine 251. It is the same as cosine 109. But here, we always go for the smaller angle and the angle between the two vectors in this problem is equal to 109. So this is an application, an important application of the scalar product of two vectors. Let's now take a sample problem on the vector product. And that is a sample problem 306 in the textbook. <clears throat> the sample problem says in the figure below vector A lies vector A lies in the xy plane has a magnitude length of 18 units and points in a direction that makes an angle of 250 degrees that's the angle between A and the positive x direction with the positive x axis. So it's like, if you want to imagine it, you are here in a tall hotel room and you are looking at the streets. There is one street that you call the x axis and there is another perpendicular street that intersects with it that you call it the y axis. 
So this is the floor, and you draw a vector on the floor in that way. This is the first vector. The second vector B has a magnitude of 12 units and points in the positive Z direction. So this is like a lamp post on the street. A lamp post that is perpendicular to the street. And we have these two vectors that we want to consider. What do we want to find? We want to find the vector product C, which is A cross B. Another way to look at the things is if you come at the top, this is the uh, z-axis. So you come and look this way. You have the x-axis here and the y-axis here. Where is the vector A? It's here in the third quadrant. And if you do that, this is how you will see the vector A. That is if you view things from the top here. So we want to find the vector product of these two vectors. You don't have, it's good to have imagination, but even if you don't have imagination, all what you have to do is express these two vectors in unit vector notation and proceed from there. Let's express A first. Vector A can be written as AXI plus AYJ. It doesn't have a Z component. It's in the XY plane. What is AX? It is A cosine of theta I plus A <coughs> sine of theta J. Now put the numbers. The magnitude of A is 18. So it is 18 cosine. Already we have the angle from the positive x axis 250 cosine 250 I plus <coughs> 18 sine. 250j. Okay, and these are both negative. This will be equal to minus 6.16i minus 16.91j. 6.16, 16.91j. This is vector A. Vector B is very simple. It's a vector pointing in the positive z direction with a magnitude of 12. So that is 12k. Now find the cross product of these two, C, which is A cross B. What do we have? Just multiply this and that. Keep the order. So you multiply first these two, and you have minus 6.16 times 12. And what do you have? I cross K i cross k then what do you have minus 16.91 times 12 and j cross k j cross k these are numbers that you can easily calculate what about these guys here comes the triangle rule okay you draw it I, J, and K. What do I have here? <coughs> well, this is I cross K. I cross K. I'm going opposite to the arrow, so that would be minus J. This is minus J. That would cancel the minus here. What about J cross K? J cross K, I am going with the arrow. That will give me I. So this will be I. Multiply these times these unit vectors. And what you will get for C is that it is equal to minus 203 I plus 74 J. We always write the things like I and then J and then K. So that's what we have here, minus 203i uh, plus 74j. That's the cross product written in unit vector notation. You can proceed and find the magnitude angle notation. Sketch the vector c. Where is the vector c? It's negative x, positive, uh, where is that? Negative x, positive y. 
So the vector C is in the second quadrant, okay? Like we have it in here. That's the vector C. If you want to apply the right hand rule here, although we didn't need to, but if in case you want it, here is how it goes. That's our vector A. Remember that B is here in the positive Z direction. So A cross B, or where is the B? The B is in the positive Z direction, and I want A cross B. This is the plane, okay, forming A and B, and here it is A cross, I go from A to B. A cross B will be the vector C, which is in that direction, perpendicular to the plane formed by A and B. So, what's the magnitude of C? The magnitude of C is two zeros, three squared, plus 74 squared, under the square root, the magnitude of C is equal to uh, 216. And the angle theta that it makes with the positive x-axis is equal to 160 degrees. I leave that for you to find. You first have to find how much is this, uh, which is tangent inverse of 74 over 2 or 3. It will be 180 minus, uh, minus 20 will be 160 degrees. So I leave that for you. These are the examples we have in the book. Now let us look at some <clears throat> textbook problems on the various ideas that we have covered in this chapter, which means we will have problems on the vector addition and problems on the multiplication of vectors. So let's look at these. We will do one or two problems on uh, the addition of vectors. The first one is this one, problem 14, which says the following. You are to make four straight line moves over a flat desert fl floor, so over the XY plane. You want to make four moves, four displacements, starting at the origin, and ending at the point with coordinates minus 140, 20. So basically what you have is if we say that this is the coordinate system, where you start from the origin, you make four moves, one, two, three, four, so that at the end of the moves, this is where you end. You end at a point with coordinates minus 140, negative x, minus 40, minus 140, plus 20. This is the overall, the net, the final displacement that you make as a result of these four moves. The X component and Y component of your moves, of the four moves in meters are, the first one is 20, 60, X component 20, Y component 60. The second one is BX minus 70. The third one is minus 20, CY. And the fourth one is minus 60, minus 70. What are the components Bx and Cy? And what are the magnitude and angle relative to the positive direction of the x-axis of the overall displacement? So let's break this down, apply the rules of uh, vector addition, and see how it goes. In this problem, we can phrase it mathematically as follows. We have four displacements that we will add up vectorially to give us the net overall displacement. So we say the following. But this is not a separate problem. This is problem 14 from the book. The net or overall displacement is the vector sum of the four individual displacements, D1 plus D2 plus 
d3 plus d4. Let us express this one by one. The net or overall displacement is there. This is where we will end. Minus 140 plus 20. So this is minus 140i plus 20j meters. What is displacement number one? The first displacement is this one, 2060. So 20i plus 60j in meters. The second displacement is bx minus 70. So bxi plus 70j in meters. <coughs> Uh, minus 70, okay, minus 70. The third one is minus 20 CY. So displacement number three is minus 20, minus 20 I plus CY J. And the fourth one, D4, is equal to minus 60, minus 70, minus 60 I minus 70 j in meters now let us put all of these back into here what do we have okay let's substitute all of these into that equation so i may need the space down here just substitute what is the net here is the net minus 140 I plus 20J is equal to the sum of all these four. Add the X's, add the Y's. Let's add the X's. 20I minus 20I, zero. BX minus 60. BX minus 60I. Let's add the J's. 60 minus 70 is minus 10 minus 10 minus 70 is minus 80 and cy so plus cy minus 80 j now equate the two sides equate the x's equate the y's minus 140 here is equal to the x component here which is bx minus 60 from which you can see that bx is minus 80 meters. <coughs> That's bx. And then equate the y's. On this side, the y is 20. On this side, it is cy minus 80. So cy is equal to 80 plus 20. That is equal to 100 meters. And we found the two unknown quantities. The last thing we have in the problem is to express the net displacement, which is this one here. It is given in unit vector notation. Let us express it in magnitude angle notation. What is the magnitude of the net displacement? It is equal to this square, 140 squared, plus 20 squared under the square root, and this is equal to 141 meters. Physically, what is this? This is the distance between the final point and the initial point, the origin. So you can, if you like, this is an extra step, you can draw what you have in here. Okay, D1, 2060, there it is. D2, how much is Bx? Bx is minus 80. So minus 80 minus 70. This is a vector in the third quadrant. That is D2. I'm applying the head tail method. D3, uh, what is CY? CY is 100. So it is minus 20 plus 100. That is D3 in the second quadrant. And D4 minus minus. So this is in the third quadrant. And that's the overall displacement. This is graphically how these numbers look like. And what we found here, the 141, is the length of this line, the distance between the origin, the starting point, and the last point there. 
What angle is made by the net displacement? Well, uh, sketch it. Okay, sketch it. Where is it? It's in the second quadrant, minus x plus y. So here is the net. Okay, and I will first find the angle it makes with the uh, x axis in that quadrant, which is this angle, 5. How much is the length of this? This is 20. How much is the length of this? 140. So the angle phi is equal to tangent inverse, tangent inverse of 20 over 140, and that will be equal to, if you put this in the calculator, that is 8 degrees. So the angle theta that it makes with the positive x-axis is equal to 180 minus 5, and that is equal to 172 degrees. And in this way, we have completely defined the uh, net displacement. Let's now take another uh, problem from the textbook on the addition of vectors, and that is problem 24. Let's see what we have here. This is really uh, a problem where you should be able to translate what is given as words, what is given as text, into equations. And then you can proceed to solve the problem. So let's read the problem and see what is there. The problem says vector A, we have two vectors, okay, that we want to add. Vector A, which is directed along an x-axis, is to be added to vector B. We don't know where is the direction of B, but we know that it has a magnitude of 6. That's the magnitude of B. So A, we know its direction, but we don't know its magnitude. B, we know its magnitude, but we don't know where is vector B. The sum of the two vectors is the third vector that is directed along the y-axis. So A is here, B is somewhere, but the addition of the two will give me a vector C that is directed along the y-axis, and its magnitude, the magnitude of the resultant, is three times the magnitude of A. Given this information, the problem says, what is the magnitude of vector A? So let's reformulate what we are given as text as words in the problem, let's translate it into equations and then proceed to find the magnitude of vector A. Okay, so here is what we are given in the problem. Let's translate what we are given. What we are given is that we have a vector A that's directed along the x-axis. So a is equal to a i. Actually, a is a x i plus a y j. But it doesn't have a y component. And therefore, we are left with this, where a x is equal to a itself. So that's what we have. Vector b has a magnitude of 6. But we don't know where is vector B. So we write it as the magnitude of B is equal to 6. We add these two to give us a third vector. I will call it C. C is equal to A plus B. So what are these? What, what, what else do we know about C? We know that C is along the y-axis. Okay, and its magnitude is three times the magnitude of A. So this is equal to 3A in the J direction. Vector B, we can write it here as B is equal to BXI plus BYJ. And now let's write this down. C is A plus B. What is C? C is 3AJ. 3A 
J is equal to A. A is AI plus B, which is BXI plus BYJ. Let's add the things here. 3AJ is equal to what do I have with I's? It's A plus BX I. And then I have BYJ. Okay, now equate the components. Do I have I here? No, I have zero. Zero is equal to A plus BX. So the X component of B is equal to minus A. What else do I have? Let's equate the J's. From here I have three A is equal to BY. And therefore, the Y component of B is equal to 3A. Now, here is vector B. What's the magnitude of B? It's BX squared plus BY squared under the square root. Substitute. The magnitude of B is equal to 6. What is BX? It is A. Square it. A squared. Plus BY. 3A. Square it. 9A squared under the square root. So, A squared plus 9A squared. 10A squared. Take it out of the square root. And you have 6 is equal to square root of uh, 10, 1 plus 9 is 10, square root of uh, 10 is there, and then I have A. So A is equal to 6 over square root of 10, which is equal to 1.9 meters, and that is the magnitude of vector A. We used all the rules of vector addition to come up with the answer. Now let's move into some problems involving the multiplication of vectors, the scalar and the vector multiplication. And we will start with uh, problem 35, in which we are given two vectors. We are given the magnitudes and the angles. Remember, we are either given the magnitudes and angles and asked to find the products, or we are given the things in unit vector notation and asked to find the operations. In this case, we are given the magnitudes and the angles. So, problem 35 in the textbook says the following. <clears throat> it says, two vectors P and Q lie in the XY plane. Their magnitudes are 35 and 6.3. Their directions are 224p and 75 4q. Let's sketch them, okay? Vector P makes an angle of 220. Where is that? That's in the third quadrant. So this is the vector P. Vector Q makes an angle of 75. So there we have the vector Q. What's the angle phi between them? Well, phi is equal to 220 minus 75, and that will give me the angle between them as equal to 145 degrees. Okay, I need that to carry out the product. So the problem gives us these vectors with their angles. We want to find their scalar product and their cross product. So the scalar product p dot q is equal to p q cosine of the angle between them. That's why we did this step. The magnitude of p, 3.5. The magnitude of q, 6.3 cosine of 145 degrees. So the dot product will be minus 18 units. The cross product. P cross Q. First, let us find the direction of this. 
use the right hand rule. Since things are given in magnitude uh, angle notation, it's very easy to do the uh, right hand rule. We want P Q cross Q. So P is the first uh, vector here. You stretch the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the first vector and go to the second one. So here is P. You, the only way to, to stretch your hand is to go this way because you want to go from P to Q. You cannot say this way because that will be the larger angle. You always have to go through the smaller angle and therefore twist your hand accordingly. This is P cross Q will give me a vector that is into the page or negative Z direction. So the direction of this cross product will be in the negative Z direction. How much is it? The magnitude of the vector product is P Q sine of phi, which is equal to, where is P? P is 3.5 times 6.3 sine of 145 degrees and that will be equal to 12.6 so we write p cross q now take everything in into consideration that's the magnitude and that's the direction so it will be minus 12.6 k in the negative z direction a very nice problem it has both types of multiplication and we are given the things in unit vector notation. Let's now take the next problem, problem 37, and conclude with it. Now the things are given in unit vector notation, okay? Not magnitude angle, we're given the vectors in unit vector notation. So let's see what do we have here. Problem 37 says three vectors are given by these equations. Okay, so let's write down the vectors. Vector A is given as 3i plus 3j minus 2k. Vector B is given as minus i minus 4j plus 2k. Vector C is given as 2i plus 2j plus k. So we are given the vectors in unit vector notation and we are asked to find or to perform various operations. Let's look at the first one. In the first one, we want to find what is A dot B cross C. B cross C. It is very important before you do anything is to ask yourself what will be the result of this operation. Well, B cross C will give me a vector. A vector dotted with another vector will give me a scalar. So whatever I do at the end of this operation, I should get a number, a scalar. Now, how do we do that? We first find what is B cross C, and then whatever we get, we take its dot product with A. So let us first find what is B cross C. You can, of course, use the triangle rule, or there is another way to do the cross product and that is using determinants and that's what I will do now. B cross C can be found using determinants as follows. You make a 3 by 3 determinant whose first row are the unit vectors I, J, K. Second row are the components of the first vector in the product which is B. What are the components of B? Minus 1 minus 4, 
2 minus 1 minus 4 2 the third row are the components of the second vector c 2 2 1 2 2 1 now find out how much is this determinant use the determinant multiplication i will expand it along this row so first we have i and then what do we have if i take the i i will take out this column and this row what is left minus 4 minus 4 right minus 4 minus 4 which is minus 8 so minus 8 then I come to the J the J has a negative with it plus minus plus what do I have with the J will expand along the uh, row and column of J so you take out this and that what is left is minus 1 minus 4 minus 1 minus 4 will be minus 5 please double check with me and then I have the K what is left I cross out this and that and I have minus 2 plus a minus 2 plus 8 will be 6 so compactly this will be minus 8 i plus 5 j plus 6 k as the cross product b cross c minus 8 i plus 5 j plus 6 k now what do i want to do i want to find the dot product of this with A. So the dot product is very simple. I with I, J with J, K with K. Okay, what do I have? A dot B cross C. Here are the two vectors that I want to multiply. A and this. So multiply the I's. Three times minus 8 is minus 24 multiply the j's 3 times 5 15 multiply the k's minus 2 times 6 is minus 12 okay this is minus 36 plus 15 that is minus 21 and that is the number that we have as a result of this operation, we get a scalar, which is just a number, and that's the number we have there. Now let's look at the second operation. In the second operation, we want to find a dot b plus c. Again, ask yourself, what will be the result of this operation? Well, b plus c is a vector. A vector dot a vector will be a scalar. So again, we will get a number. How much is that? That's part B. We want to find A dot B plus C. A is there. 3i plus 3j minus 2k. What is B plus C? You add them component by component. So i minus 1 plus 2 is i. And then the j is minus 4 plus 2 is minus 2j. And then I have the case. 2 plus 1 is 3. Plus 3k. Now i dot i, j dot j, k dot k. i dot i will be 3. j dot j, 3 times minus 2 is minus 6. And then minus 2 times 3 is another minus 6 so 3 minus 12 will be minus 9 again a scalar a number the last operation we want to do is a cross b plus c what do i get now i will get a vector because this is a vector crossed with another vector so the result will be a vector let's see how do we do that part c a cross b b plus c 
cross product, you will form a determinant. So let's form the determinant. I, J, and K. This row are the components of A, which is 3, 3, minus 2. 3, 3, minus 2. The third row are the components of this B plus C. There we have it. So I have I minus 2 plus 3. And now carry out the product. The I. You take out this and that. And I have 9. Okay. 9 minus 4 is 5. Then I have minus J. And what do I have? I cross out this and that. 9 plus 2. 9 plus 2 is 11. And then I have K. I cross out these. Minus 6. Okay. Minus 6 minus 3 is minus 9. So this will be 5I minus 11J minus 9K. As the result of this operation, I get a vector now because that's the result of the vector multiplication. The last problem I leave it for you to look at. It's uh, about the uh, multiplication of vectors, vector multiplication, but not in the unit vector notation rather than, uh, again, uh, magnitude angle. So I leave that for you uh, to consider. With that, we come to the end of our discussion on chapter three, in which we discussed the mathematics of vectors, especially how to add and multiply the vectors. The addition of vectors we will need it throughout the course in Physics 101 and Physics 102. The scalar multiplication we need it in Chapter 7 when we consider the concept of war. The vector multiplication we need it in Chapters 10 and 11 when we talk about the torque due to a force.